Hello and welcome once more to this Red Gaming Tech video. Myself, Amato, as always, I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. Today, we're going to start things off with some unfortunately bad news for Intel. As you all know, Intel have definitely not had the best time when it comes to all things security, as we have had several vulnerabilities which have been discovered, starting, of course, with the most famous Meltdown and Spectre. And now, unfortunately, the bad times are still coming, as researchers have recently started to uncover new flaws in their software, including a high severity flaw in their pro processor diagnostic tool. And this was actually discovered by the security researcher Jesse Michael from Eclipsium. And there's also a bug in the data center for SSDs, which actually has been found by Intel engineers themselves. So let's talk about the first one, the one in the software, the processor diagnostic tool and is rated 8.2 out of 10 on the CVSS scale, which, to put it in plain terms, makes it a high severity vulnerability. And according to Intel's latest security advisory, which of course you can find linked below, the flaw may, quote, allow an authenticated user to potentially enable escalation of privilege, information disclosure, or denial of service via local access. And any versions at all that are older than 4.1.2.24 are affected. And again, the second vulnerability, which was discovered by the internal team over at Intel, is actually a medium severity vulnerability in the SD, uh, sorry, SSD DC S4500 slash S4600 series, which was sold to data center customers. So probably not going to affect anyone watching this video. Now this actually rates a 5.3 score on that very same scale and basically enables a unprivileged user to enable privilege escalation via physical access. However, there is some good news. These were obviously, well, one was discovered by Intel, one was discovered by Eclipsium, but they were actually working with Intel to actually disclose this, and Intel has already had patches ready in time for this public announcement. Again, you will find a link to a lengthy post from them, which gives all the details and also some recommendations. Uh, to an update for the diagnostic tool and a bunch of other stuff as well. So if you are going to be affected by this, I suggest you look at the link in the description for what to do. It's so not great that we've now seen security vulnerabilities on the software side, but obviously it is good news that Intel already has a fix available, ready for any users who may be affected. And also we have some good news for Linux users as well. Next up. So you may be familiar with the system attacks that affect hyperthreading on Linux-based systems. And Oracle security researchers have been hard at work working on a security feature for Linux kernels that could protect Linux systems from this attack. And again, as on the Windows side, there's been multiple side channel attacks discovered, including L1TF4 shadow and MDS attacks. Unfortunately, Oracle have not said whether or not the recent mitigations would be through the kernel address space isolation only that it will protect against the l1 tf4 shadows and unfortunately the other side channel attacks are a bit of a question mark at present now i will say however that the code is still proof of concept for the kernel address space isolation which has been renamed cassie for obvious reasons but it is more stable than the first version of the mitigation feature and they're basically looking for feedback on how to improve it before they actually attempt to bring it into an official release of the Linux kernel. So let's move on from Intel to AMD once more. Now we've got quite a few AMD news uh, pieces for you today, but the first one I'm going to discuss is actually regarding Ryzen 3000. As you may have seen talk around the internet of some high idle voltages for the 3000 series. This has come up quite a few times and AMD has actually investigated and declared it to be a non-issue. Basically, and I'll give the full statement in a moment, they have called it what is known as the observer effect. Observer, sorry, excuse me. Basically what that means is the process of measuring the load on the CPU in itself causes load on the processor. In the case of Ryzen 3000, monitoring software appeared to be polling each processor core for load by sending it an instruction at a high rate of speed. And this basically actually means on the processor's level, it thinks that the core is being subjected to, uh, subjected to excuse me, a high workload and responds by increasing clock speeds and, of course, voltages. So 
kind of explains things, but I do have a full statement here from Robert Hannock, who is the head of technical marketing for processors over at AMD. And he said, quote, we have determined that many popular monitoring tools are quite aggressive in how they monitor the behavior of a call. Some of them wake every call in the system for 20 milliseconds and do this as often as every, every 200 milliseconds. From the perspective of the process of firmware, this is interpreted as a workload that's asking for sustained performance from the calls. The firmware is designed to respond in, to such a pattern by boosting higher clocks, higher voltages. So, if you're sitting there staring at your monitoring tool, the tool is constantly instructing all the cores to wake up and boost. This will keep the clock speeds high, and the corresponding voltages will be elevated to support that boost. This is a classic case of observer effect. You're expecting the tool to give valid data, but it's actually producing invalid data by virtue of how it's measuring. And for those of you going, okay, so how do I get an accurate read on what's actually going on my processor? You know, especially if you're overclocking or just want to know what's going on inside your machine, you want to be able to do that as much as you can without affecting the CPU itself. And Robert himself mentioned CPU Z to be the most accurate at measuring voltages without causing this observer effect. And he posted it on Reddit about this, and you can find the thread linked in the description below this video, where he provided some screenshots to basically um, show off this fact. And the original post from Robert Halleck is rather lengthy on the post, so I would highly recommend you read it because he goes into a lot more detail than I am going through here. I'm pretty much giving you the cliff notes of what he said, uh, but he gives quite a few recommendations which are quite helpful. But there is one that I will focus on here. He gave a few tips on how to actually measure voltages correctly for anyone suffering from this issue. He said don't run multiple monitoring utilities simultaneously, for obvious reasons. Uh, he also recommended to close apps such as your command center for your motherboard. They are themselves monitoring tools and also set BIOS voltages to their default or auto values except those voltage domains that are adjusted by your memory's XMP profile and also keep your chipset software, Windows version and motherboard BIOS up to date. So there you have it. For those of you wondering about those high voltage issues on Ryzen 3000, Robert Halleck has spoken and again you'll find a link to his full statement in the description below this video. So let's move over to Radeon 7 as I have a couple of updates to what I discussed yesterday. So go watch my video from yesterday if you haven't got around to it already. I'm sure most of you have, but I will... Well, you can find it probably in the recommended. Anyway, regardless, one of the things I discussed yesterday was how a report surfaced basically stating that Radeon 7 had been declared end of life by AMD. Now, this wasn't confirmed. I just want to stress that immediately. Um, go watch my video if you want the full skinny on what's going on there. But we do have a couple of updates regarding this. The first of which is apparently Radeon 7 is not alone in being declared end of life. Apparently Vega 10 is going to be keeping it company. Both the Vega 64 and Vega 56 are apparently being reaching the end of the line as well. For those of you who perhaps been trying to acquire one or just keep your eyes on the scene when it comes to that. Vega 64 and Vega 56 have been increasingly difficult to find at a reasonable price, so it kind of makes sense to say that Vega is probably end of life as well. But the more important update I have for this is a bit of a statement from AMD regarding the alleged end of life status for Radeon 7. Now I say they've responded, and they have, they have responded, but it's a response that doesn't really mean anything. And you'll see what I mean when I actually read it. As tomshardware.co.uk reached out to them to basically confirm whether or not this was true, and all they said was, quote, We continue to see strong availability of Radeon 7 in the channel for both gamers and creators. So you can see what I mean, it doesn't really answer the question. We continue to see strong availability, okay, for now, but if it's reached end of life, that will soon change. It doesn't really answer the question, to be honest, they've kind of dodged it. So that leads me to believe that it's probably true. Again, it could be false, it could be they're, they're planning on doing it, but they haven't done it yet. But as I discussed in my video yesterday, it would actually make perfect sense for them to declare it end of life. You know, the, the RX 5700 XT basically makes it meaningless to buy the Radeon 7. So, again, go watch my video from yesterday if you want the full lowdown on that. But that's AMD's response to it, and it's it, it's a response, but it's not really an answer, if you know what I mean. 
So, with all that said, that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support has been highly appreciated. Do remember to like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.